Hassan. Today's episode is the impact of the transgender movement on children with Maria Keffler, author of Desist, Detrans, and Detox, Getting Your Child Out of the Gender Cult. After the program, we'll be back live with Father Brian Mullady taking your calls and emails. But first, the transgender movement, What Catholics Need to Know, starts now. I'm Mary Hassan, your guide to this series on the transgender movement, What Catholics Need to Know. Join us for our discussion with Maria Keffler. She's an author and expert, and we're going to be discussing the impact of gender ideology on children and what parents need to know. Stay tuned. Jesus answered, He who made them from the beginning made them male and female. Maria, it's a delight to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I enjoy getting to talk with you. Well, and this is a great topic uh, for you. You bring so much expertise for the sake of our audience. I mean, you're a mom, you're an educator, but you also have, have written what I think is the book for parents, Desist, de Trans, Detox, um, how to help your child get out of the gender cult. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're also the co-founder of an organization called Advocates Protecting Children. So you bring a wealth of experience, both in terms of how this problem is affecting children, but also what parents and families can do. So I guess that's where I'd like to begin. Mm -hmm. um, this has seemed to come out of nowhere for so many parents. And I, I think parents are scared, parents mm -hmm. and grandparents. So why is this happening? What, what is it that has changed in society? It really has come out of left field for a lot of people, but as I've been looking into where it came from, I think this has been very strategically mm -hmm. placed. Um, what's happening to kids is they're being indoctrinated into these um, alternate sexuality and gender identities through a variety of places, but the public school and social media are really two places that are driving it. Social media is so, uh, it's unregulated. Mm -hmm. You know, we have laws about what you can say in, in movies and in TV, but social media is completely unregulated and, and there are just bubbles, these filter bubbles that kids get into that are being driven by people who have a vested interest in driving them toward gender transition because it's a very lucrative industry. Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there. So mm -hmm. let me focus first just on the social media point okay. because I think that's an area that a lot of parents don't feel confident in. Yeah. They think, well, what am I supposed to do? Take my kid's phone away? What, what do I do here? And I think one of the things that, that I've learned over time is that certain sites are mm -hmm. worse than others. TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is visual. Mm -hmm. what, what can you tell parents that they need to understand about social media and how it draws their kids in? You know, anyone who hasn't watched The Social Dilemma really needs to. That really explains what's happening here. Social media has been designed around psychological techniques to keep you hooked mm. because social media is being paid for by advertising. You know, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what's happening on social mm -hmm. media. They want to keep us engaged. And so they keep showing people more of what they want to see. Oh, you liked that little video about dieting? Here's a bunch of other videos you might like. Oh, this one's about anorexia. There are mm -hmm. pro-anorexia groups. There are pro-bulimia groups. And the social media algorithms, they're not watching anything except numbers. They're mm -hmm. trying to keep you engaged longer and longer and longer so that they can show you more ads and draw in more revenue. So, so a child who's merely curious, mm -hmm. for example, about something related to transgender identities mm -hmm. or who takes a quiz. There are quizzes all over oh, yeah. the internet. Am I transgender? Am I, you know, all these things even doing that is going to um, sort of trigger those algorithms. I think even less than just mm. doing that. I think just being on social media, mm. this is going to come to them. It's not even them going yeah. to it, it is coming to them. At Advocates Protecting Children, we really have taken a hard line on this and mm -hmm. we say no social media, no smartphones. Mm -hmm. And that really scares a lot of parents. Yeah. They think, you know, my child needs his or her smartphone. 
No, it's too dangerous. It's really yeah, when, too dangerous. When you look at, at the costs, and I think, you know, on social media, one of the things I found helpful is to tell parents to actually go and look, mm -hmm. to understand what are these videos, what are these, these YouTubes or TikToks that show you a child uh, narrating basically mm -hmm. their transition yeah. and making it seem glamorous and, and just getting a, a real look at what your child is seeing, I mm -hmm. think can be a wake up call. It can, and it, it is shocking. I got social media when my kids were, gosh, in, in elementary school, mm -hmm. because I knew when they hit middle school, they were gonna get social media accounts. So I wanted to be ahead of that a little bit. So I got on a few social media sites and I'm really shocked. I mean, I don't think any child should have any social media and I'm right on the edge of saying adults shouldn't have it either yeah. because I feel myself getting mm -hmm. sucked into scrolling right. and scrolling and scrolling and it's really a harmful place. Even apart from the transgender issue, there's mm -hmm. really good data that shows the more time, particularly for teenagers, the yeah. more time you're spending on social media, the more likely it is you're going to be depressed and, mm -hmm. and anxious. Yeah, so, we've seen suicide rates going up concurrently currently mm -hmm. with the advent of social media. Now, can we say one's causing the other? No, but we can look at it and say that's really suspicious it's that they're factor. going up at the same time. Yeah. 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 So what about schools? You mentioned that also as a problem. So tell me how kids get exposed to these belief systems that they could be born in the wrong mm -hmm. body or they might be transgender. How does that happen? It is everywhere in the public schools. It is in the water, it is in the air, <laughs> it is in the wallpaper, literally. If you uh -huh. walk down the halls of a public school, nothing gets more real estate on the walls than the LGB and TQ. And right now, frankly, the LGB is a little bit passe. You've kind of got to yeah. be in the TQ to really be cool and trendy. It's being taught in classes. I've heard so many parents tell me, well, this isn't in my school yet. And I say, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. You just mm -hmm. maybe aren't seeing it yet. This was how I got introduced to this. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine was looking around for some, just some summer school information on the website of our neighborhood schools. And she came across this transgender student policy working meeting that was that evening she said Maria will you go with me I don't want to go alone and we were horrified at what we heard there were probably 12 or 15 people there were there were students there were members of a local activist group there there were parents all sitting around a table talking about what they wanted to see in these policies and these are policies like boys get to go in the girls bathroom girls get to go in right. the boys bathroom you know the drill but the overarching theme of that evening and what shocked me the most was how they consider parents a threat. And they were talking mm -hmm. about how to hide this stuff from parents because parents are dangerous to their children, which was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. and, and we have known in the education field for years and years and years and years that the strongest predictor of academic success is involved parents. Right. It's not a great teacher, it's mm -hmm. not enough money in the school system, it's not the coolest tech, it's having involved parents. So and yet why? about this, they want to cut parents out. And, yeah. and in fact, there are a number of lawsuits now going mm -hmm. on in various parts of the country where parents are suing schools mm -hmm. because the schools hid from, from mm -hmm. the parents what was happening with their own child, yeah. transition them, and the child aid just, you know, parents don't believe it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's happening and, and it's well, there. Well, what shocked me was wondering, how are they getting away from this? Because mm -hmm. FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Protection Act, says that parents have a right to all the information the school right. has about their children. And how are they getting around that? And a lawsuit in Wisconsin uncovered it. The mm -hmm. lawyer who, who, was who was arguing that found that the schools were telling the teachers to put notes about kids in their personal notes right. rather mm -hmm. than in the school um, school. I've seen that curriculum. actually in some policies where mm -hmm. they, they think it's not going to be discovered, but it's, it's a subterfuge. Mm -hmm. It really is cutting parents out. Yeah. So, so the schools are a problem. Mm -hmm. um, social media is a problem. What happens to, uh, what should parents do if they see signs in their child that, that something's amiss mm. and, and maybe they don't know it's a transgender issue? What should they look for? Be looking for 
the social circle around your child. Mm -hmm. What's happening in that social circle? Because this is absolutely a social contagion. I talk to parent after parent. I even talked to the director of a, a camp, summer camp program, who said at the beginning of the week, we had one child in the cabin who said she was transgender, he was transgender. By the end of the week, we've got three more. It's absolutely a social contagion. So yeah. if your kid's friends are doing this, that's a big red flag. When you start seeing, um, and I even hate saying this because it's all based on these regressive sex-based stereotypes. But when you see a girl suddenly cutting her hair very short, mm. suddenly refusing to wear dresses, if this child has always been that way, great, no right, problem. Right, right. But it's these sudden changes. Um, you see a boy who starts wanting to wear pink, who starts wanting mm -hmm. to wear ruffles and skirts. Mm -hmm. Again, the who has never done that before. Right, right. These are some red flags so changes to watch in for. behaviors, mm -hmm. trying to match up to one stereotype or another. Yeah. And you're right, it's regressive. We tried to get rid of stereotypes, right? And right. Now, now it's all about figuring out who you are by comparing yourself to stereotypes. Yeah. So what about um, what about other things? We've I've heard about kids binding, mm. teenage girls binding, what is that? Yeah, binding is where, it's pretty much a corset, uh, but it binds the chest, it binds the breasts. It's very restrictive, it's very dangerous. And why would a girl do that? Um, to try to have the appearance of a boy. Um, if you find out your child, your daughter's wearing a binder, she is fully sucked into this ideology mm -hmm. because it is all about creating a persona, creating the presentation of the opposite sex or of no sex at all. Non-binary mm -hmm. is the new thing right. where they want to have no sex presentation at all. And uh, sadly, horrifyingly, I'm hearing of gender nullification surgeries where doctors are trying to create a smooth area right. down there with no sex characteristics mm -hmm. at all. This is just Frankenstein medicine. Yeah, yeah. It, it's cruel. Mm -hmm. So so if a child begins to, to go down this path and, and you realize this, you start to see these signs, how do you open up that conversation with a child? And what are the things that as a parent you want to be thinking about being ready to do or how to react? How do you handle that situation? The big thing to recognize that this is a cult. Your mm. child is getting drawn into a cult. The best yeah. thing you can do is prevent that from happening yeah. because once the child is drawn into the cult, their loyalty has left you. The loyalty has left the family and the loyalty is now with the cult. And it is very hard to get that back. Um, I talk to parents all the time who are going through this and, and one therapist who is just a fantastic therapist who's dealt with this a lot has said this takes a long time. It's mm. very hard, it takes a lot of finesse, a lot of work to draw a child back. So my first advice would be, don't let it happen in the first place. Um, I quote your book, mm -hmm. Get Out Now. Um, yeah. I cannot tell anyone with good conscience that, that public schools are a safe place to be anymore. If you can get your child out, get your yeah. child out. Secondly, take away the smartphones mm -hmm. and the social media. Mm -hmm. Those three things will limit a lot of the social yeah. contagion factors. Right. But once a child has kind of fallen into it mm -hmm. and they've gotten sucked into the cult, you need to do a deprogramming strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's what my book goes into. It's basically cutting off all of the bad influences, uh -huh. the things that are keeping them sucked into gender ideology, right. surrounding them with healthy adults, healthy influences, people who are gonna reflect reality to them, starting to engage their critical thinking skills by mm. asking gentle questions. So if gender is fluid, when is it, like, is it fixed or is it fluid? And, and how do you know when it's fixed, if it's fixed? And if it's never fixed, why would we ever do surgery on somebody? And, and if it's fluid, what if they change mm -hmm. their mind tomorrow? Asking those questions in a real gentle way to get them mm -hmm. to start thinking. Um, but it is a really long process to pull a child out. Yeah, I, one of the things that struck me about both your book, but I've also heard you speak on this, is you talk about how important it is to work on strengthening that relationship mm -hmm. and to build out other areas of the relationship yeah. so that everything doesn't become focused just on this question of identity, mm -hmm. which, which is something, you know, I've heard parents say that their child, it, it's like their world narrows. Mm -hmm. 
they stop playing the piano, they yeah. stop sports. Everything is about living this identity. Yeah. So what are, what are some tips you might have about how to do that? Especially That's if a child is hostile, right. as some are at these junctures. Yeah, if your child is not yet hostile, and you can build that relationship mm -hmm. up, definitely do that. That's good mm -hmm. advice for all of us to, to do things together with the mm -hmm. child. Um, if they are getting sucked into gender ideology, it does become this narrow focus to the exclusion of everything else. Mm -hmm. So invite them to do other things. If the mm -hmm. child likes to take a cooking class, say, hey, I'd love to mm -hmm. sign us up for a cooking class. Let's go do that. Try to do things that don't have anything to do with gender. Mm -hmm. And I think a parent's first reaction is, I need the silver bowl. It. I need the thing that's going to stop this right now. I need the right argument, and unfortunately, the flip to switch. Yeah, right. or the not, switch to flip. <laughs> right. You're not going to you're not going to find that switch. But yeah. you need to just really work on the relationship and get them involved in other mm -hmm. things. When we talk mm -hmm. to people who have detransitioned, they have really been grateful for parents who didn't buy into the ideology, right. but who kept the relationship open mm. and tried to invite them into other things, draw them out of that toxic culture and community that they're in. So what does that mean for things like names and pronouns? How do you Ooh. suggest handling that? I do not think it is ever right to lie. Mm -hmm. And using a pronoun that is not biologically accurate, I consider that to be a lie. It is. Now, <laughs> yeah. depending on your relationship mm -hmm. with the child, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of like aunts, uncles, grandparents, yeah. If you've got a niece, a nephew, a grandson, mm -hmm. a granddaughter who's doing this, and the parents are all in on it, it's going to be harder to hold the line yeah. because the parents may very well cut you off, and you don't want that. So in those situations, I recommend trying to avoid the mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. The pronoun is a third-person pronoun. It's the he, she. It's not you. When I talk to you, right, I say, Mary, how are yes, you? Yes. I don't even use the he, she. Mm -hmm. So that can be avoided. If the name is a real issue, the child is really pushing for a, a name that is not the name the parents Mm -hmm. gave, right. and especially if the parents are not in favor of using an alternate name, I think it's important to reflect reality to the child mm -hmm. and say, you know what, that name that your mom and dad gave you, that was the first gift your parents ever mm -hmm. gave you. Mm -hmm. That's the first gift we give our, our child yeah. when they're born is a name. Right. Some right. names have a lot of significance, familial significance. Yeah. And so I think you can say, you know, I consider that really important. Mm -hmm. And when you call that your dead name, that really hurts me because that cuts you off from right. me. Right. The other thing I've heard from parents is that when they're trying to help retether a child mm -hmm. to reality, mm -hmm. and so they're not using this alternate name, they're not, they're trying not to affirm in any way the child's rejection mm -hmm. of their sex body, yeah. that it can be really damaging when other adults oh, yeah. whom the child trusts go down that path with the child, because then yeah. you're, you're creating a division there where these, these cool adults are siding with the child and mm -hmm. the parents are... Uh, you know, fitting that stereotype of, of the mean old parents. Yeah, well, unfortunately, what's happened in society is teachers and mm -hmm. neighbors and other adults, they're really getting the message that parents who don't agree to a gender transition are hateful, bigoted, mm -hmm. toxic, abusive. And by supporting that child in their mm -hmm. ge preferred gender, you are that, that child's only safe person. You're the heroic savior. You're the one saving them from these toxic parents. That's the message. And I've talked to parents who've said, my child was babysitting and the, baby, the parents are affirming this transgender stuff behind our back. Yeah. It's happening everywhere, which is why we say you've really got to try to lay down those walls and mm -hmm. keep out the negative influences and keep the child surrounded by positive ones who are all in agreement with each other. That's what children need. Children right, need right. all the adults in their lives to be saying the same thing right, to them. to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and surround them with love and be patient. Yeah. So uh, give us a word of encouragement here in our, our last minute here. You know, what, what can you say to parents when it, when it looks darkest, when it's so painful? What can you tell them? We are hearing more and more of parents who are getting their kids back. 
Um, this is hard work, as you know, fighting yeah. this ideology. And what keeps me in it is when I get an email from someone who says, we followed the advice that we found on your resource list mm -hmm. and our child came back to us. And that just makes my day. And we're hearing yeah. that more and more and more. And I really think we are reaching a tipping point mm -hmm. where people are seeing what's happening in the schools. People are standing up and saying no more. I hate to see all these lawsuits happening, but unfortunately, right. I think that's what it's going to take. And lies don't stand forever. Right. No lie lasts forever. This is going to fall down like the house of cards it is. And it's time to end the harm. Absolutely. So. Thank you very much, Maria. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mary. Parents and grandparents are understandably concerned about gender ideology and its impact on children and adolescents. So what do you need to know? Well, first, that gender ideology affects every child and adolescent. The world of childhood and adolescence is no longer innocent, happy, and healthy. Children's media from pre-K through adolescence has become highly sexualized. Even children's shows such as Blue's Clues, which recently released a video promoting transgender and non-binary identities, are promoting gender ideology to our youngest children. Social media is available to any child with a phone, and it's saturated with messaging that encourages children to explore alternate sexualities and gender identities. From TikTok to Snapchat to YouTube, teens are encouraged to celebrate peers who announce an LGBT identity, and they're often taught to shame those who fail to give the required approval. As one middle school teacher told me, in a rainbow world, no child wants to be the boring kid, attracted to the opposite sex and identifying as a normal male or female. Our schools, particularly public schools, have embraced gender ideology. It's presented to children as the truth about who they are. But private schools and even some Catholic schools are not immune. Parents have to be vigilant. Many parents are rightly wary of school curricular materials. But gender ideology and false beliefs about sexuality and identity are heavily promoted in the school culture through peers and sometimes by school counselors or teachers. School policies routinely direct teachers and staff to hide a child's identity confusion from parents unless the child of any age gives permission. Some parents have only discovered that their child's school encouraged the child's confusion and gender transition after the fact, after the child developed serious mental health issues or became convinced that they were born in the wrong body. So all children, even those who never question their own identity as male or female, are influenced by the rise of gender ideology. It's shaping their, their self-understanding. And it also coerces those who are raised in religious households to keep quiet about their beliefs. They may feel like they live a double life, one at home where they can speak the truth and a different life at school where they're afraid to tell others what they really believe. Imagine, it's hard on adults to feel like they're the only one who believes in the truth, that males and females are different and that sex cannot change. Imagine being an adolescent, facing an army of peers who are ready to reject you if you don't support or applaud transgender beliefs. The most vulnerable children, those who already have mental health issues, who are on the autism spectrum, or who struggle with feeling rejected or bullied, may find themselves pulled into the transgender world, where they begin to question and eventually to reject their biological sex. They discover a new community that accepts and encourages them down this path. Social contagion and peer influence are real. And once a child begins to go down the transgender pathway, it can be very difficult to turn things around, at least in the short term. So what should parents and grandparents do? Well, let me give you three Ps. Be proactive, be protective, and be personal. First, be proactive. Don't wait until your child is affected to lay a strong foundation. Teach them the truth about who they are, the reality of biological sex, let them know it's normal to feel insecure, doubts, to feel vulnerable, or even to dislike their body at times. You'll be right there to help them sort things out. 
Strengthen your relationship with your children today, now. Don't wait until there's a crisis. So be proactive. Second, be protective. If your child is in a school situation or has peers who are pulling them in the wrong direction, then take steps to change things. Be vigilant about pornography. Many adolescents are drawn into the transgender world through exposure to pornography. And limit the child's time on social media. Even apart from transgender ideology, the more time a child spends on social media, the more likely they are to become depressed and anxious, especially girls. Don't be afraid to act boldly. Trust your instincts. Third, take a personal approach. If your child is vulnerable, take action to limit the negative influences, leading them towards poor decisions. But take time to understand your child's vulnerabilities. Encourage them to discover new strengths and talents. If your child announces a transgender identity, you have to be in control of your own emotions. Realize your child needs your guidance now more than ever. Be patient. You need to understand what your child is thinking and how to help. Ask questions, listen, and take your time. Most of all, love your child and be confident. Spend time with him or her and discover the beautiful person that God has given you. Don't be afraid to ask for help, but trust that even the most difficult situations can work for the good. God works miracles. I've seen it. So love, love each other, and trust in God. Trust in the God who loves your child even more than you do. And there we are, part four of the transgender movement, What Catholics Need to Know, part of our special EWTN week-long open line event. I'm Tom Price. Today we're joined by Father Brian Mullady. We'll be uh, talking about what you just heard on today's program. This has been an amazing week. It really, really has. First of all, let me give you the phone numbers because uh, Father Brian is here to take your calls at 833 833- 288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening outside of North America, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. You know, on Monday of uh, Part 1, we played a cultural overview of all this, the transgender movement, uh, along with Ryan Anderson, the author of When Harry Became Sally. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, Tuesday, the so-called gender-affirming interventions, where we talked with uh, certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon Deacon Patrick Lappert. And then on Wednesday, yesterday, what does the church say about transgender issues with Dr. Teresa Farnan, the founding member of the Person and Identity Project, and the program that we just now heard, The Impact of the Transgender Movement on Children, with Maria Keffler, the author of a wonderful book, Desist, Detrans, and detox, getting your child out of the gender cult. As, uh, as, as I mentioned, I'm joined today by Father Brian Mullady. Father, the first thing off the bat, uh, here we are in 2022. Did you ever dream you would be talking about things like this? I never did, but you know, uh, once in the 20th century, we began to basically manipulate things, and we had no respect for the laws of God. Mm-hmm. And that, be, interestingly enough, it began in an incident which is still romanticized, the sinking of the Titanic, where, you know, they wrote on the hull, God himself can't sink this ship. Mm. Human technology was so great. And then World War I was the first war where there was no morals whatsoever in the killing machines. Mm-hmm. And then the so-called eugenics of the 30s, uh, which uh, was localized and finally... Um, experience its deepest expression in Nazism, um, it's, it's not surprising in a way. Because what they're trying to do is dehumanize man, and especially the family. The attack is on the family. And of course, gender is central to the family. So what does moral theology say about gender, Father? Well, uh, I don't know what your former programs have had, 
But the whole idea of gender is central to the world. Obviously, animals have gender, many of them. Mm -hmm. There's very few that don't. Um, and those genders are oriented to life and the reproduction of life. It's the way God keeps life going in a similar way that he keeps plants going through pollination and things like that. And so the origin of the difference between the sexes turns around two things. First of all, the whole idea of life. And secondly, the idea that creation is a gift and a grace which demands of us that we experience love. But love here means giving yourself to another. John Paul II has this wonderful reflection on the whole thing in um, the Theology of the Body, where, as you recall, in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, it's just stated, male and female, God made them. Mm -hmm. And then he says, increase and multiply. So that's a sort of life-giving uh, relationship. But in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, the personal reactions are given to the two human beings. And the first is just Adam alone. Uh, and the word that's used for Adam here is uh, non-gender. It, it represents the whole human race. It's somewhat like in the Latin language and in others. A homo means mankind in general. Mm -hmm. But vir means the masculine, the male. And femina means the female. Well, Adam examines himself in relationship to all of creation because God gives him these wonderful gifts, among which is the ability to name things, and that means in Hebrew that they know their nature, but he finds none like himself. And God says it's not good for man to be alone. Why not? Because man is a person, and as the Second Vatican Council was clear about stating, in God him and Spes, a person has two characteristics uh, because of the mortal soul. No person may be an object of use but must be a subject of love. And secondly, a person only realizes themselves in a sincere gift of themselves to another. Now obviously if there is no other, you can't sincerely give yourself as a gift to one like you. And so the creation might be complete in that regard. Uh, God casts Adam into a sleep, which symbolically uh, underlines the fact that he is in no way responsible for the creation of Eve. Only God is. And then from his rib, and again the way that the uh, ancient texts reflect truths, is that the woman comes from the rib of man First of all, because had she come from his head, she'd be his superior. And if she come from his foot, she'd be his inferior. And instead, she comes from the rib because they are uh, equals when it comes to being persons. And both have an orientation to giving and receiving. One author I read, uh, one of the fathers of the church, says that Adam spends his whole existence looking for his lost rib. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is the origin of the union of marriage in sure, a way. Sure, sure. But anyway, Adam, who's named all the animals and found none like him, now names her. And she accepts being named by him. She receives it and silently returns it. And then you have this text about the two becoming one flesh and the text about they were naked and not ashamed because they looked on the body as a means by which they could give a sincere gift of themselves in their souls to each other and then ratify it in being the means by which God procreates or brings forth human life. And why does God want to bring forth human life? Because his whole purpose in creating the world is the glorification of God in Christ. In other words, he wants us to go to heaven to disseminate his goodness in this way, and he can't people heaven if there's no people. So they have to be people in order to people have it. Yeah. So um, this is central to the uh, nature of the world. It's central to the natural law. And to try to reverse this 
demands so much uh, artificial mental gymnastics. It's like Frankenstein yes. almost. Yes. Only even in Frankenstein's case. Remember, he stole all the parts of the body that already existed yep. and just put them together. Mm -hmm. Now, they're trying to reverse human nature. And all healing, at least in the ancient ideas about medicine, and this is really true today, if there's no power from your nature which can be used by the artificial means of medicine to accomplish healing, eventually you die. Mm. So what medicine does is is seek to accentuate some part of your nature in order to resist a threat to your nature from another part of your body, which is unnatural. Wow. What they've done is introduce the unnatural character by artificial means to create neutral figures, almost like machines, where man is becoming more and more mechanized. I was just reading a meditation or a meditation maybe just a critique mm -hmm. uh -huh. of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and this author wrote about 20 years ago before the movies uh -huh. and he said the ring is actually in Tolkien's idea it's it's true it's power and it's true it's sin but it's because it symbolizes the world of machines mm, wow. as opposed to the natural world yeah so we're trying to create human beings but by their own will and choice, rebel against the laws of God, and seek to make themselves a machine. Yeah, and uh, and that will not end well. You're listening to a special no. open line uh, presentation, the transgender movement, what Catholics need to know. Today we brought you uh, part four of this wonderful series hosted by Mary Hassan. And I want to bring in the audience here, Father, at 833 288 EWTN. If you have something to say about uh, either what Father was just saying or about uh, any of the series that we have aired, uh, and a quick reminder that we're going to bring you part five tomorrow, and that is going to be just a little sneak preview here Catholic pastoral care for transgender issues with Father Philip Bochansky. He is the executive director of Courage yes. International, a wonderful apostolate. And then, of course, after the program, we'll be back with EWTN's vice president for theology, Mr. Colin Donovan. But phones are open right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Father, I've got to say, it's one thing for uh, adults like you and I to be discussing things which can get very complex, but it's another thing for a child who have to who has to uh, deal with uh, weighty matters like this. They're exposed on social media. They're they're getting you know you know there there's peer pressure. There's a million different factors that uh, these they, these poor kids have to go through. Yes, the program today that was on NWM was excellent in examining those things. And the um, woman who was interviewed basically said that we have to avoid social media for children. Mm. In fact, she'd forbid it altogether because they're constantly showing things that we're not aware of on social media that children can view and participate in. One just simple example is, am I transgender? They have a test. Mm. And if you answer some of these questions, it suggests that you're in the wrong body, and, you know. And and then they also try to get them to change their name to their transgender name, and they call it their dead name, the name the parents gave them. Oh. And then she also says, if you're going to public school, if you can possibly do it, get your child out of public school. Because public school, it, it's in the water. <laughs> That's wow. what she said. And wow. on the walls, yeah, transgenderism. And she also said it's a cult. Because what it's encouraging you to do is um, the schools look on parents as a threat to their agenda to neuter people. And so uh, what they're trying to do is get them to more identify mm. with other people who are transgendered than with their parents, which is very much like Jim Jones and uh, yes. you know, all the cults that have ever existed. Yes. Or the gangs, for example, in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. where your loyalty is more to the gang than it is to your family. Mm. And so her recommendation is, of course, that you uh, seek to get to know your children, that you have positive experiences they can relate to, 
and that you gently try to lead them along to critical thinking about what's going on. It's hardly you choosing your gender, because once you make a choice and go beyond hormonal therapy, you ain't going to be able to choose to turn it back if you get uh, older. Well, yeah, and also uh, social media for, for the very young, uh, they are not the passive babysitter that maybe, you know, the uh, Howdy Doody show was in the 50s or anything like that. Uh, there's, there's an awful lot of agenda going on, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> transgenderism is certainly much more wicked than there's Princess Summer, Fall, Winter, Spring, <laughs> and Clarabelle Clown. That's and, right. That's right. And, and uh, yeah, no, I used to watch Howdy Doody when I was a little boy. Sure, sure. And uh, it was very, very uh, innocuous, really. But, yeah, very benign, of course. And, and you can't say that about what is out there today. No, 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 uh, no. And even the television shows for children mm -hmm. were oriented toward virtue and family, and not, not today. Absolutely. I want to give out that phone number again, and that is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. We're doing a special edition of Open Line this week. Uh, today, of course, with Father Brian Milady. I'm Tom Price, uh, phone in for uh, Jack Williams. Jack will be back on uh, tomorrow's program. We're going to get to the phones just as soon as uh, our screener, Matt Kabinsky, is getting those calls screened uh, just as quickly as possible. Again, uh, the program that we heard a little bit earlier, and Father, you, you mentioned this, uh, Marie Keffler, she is the author of Desist, Detrans, and Detox, Getting Your Child Out of the Gender Cult. And yeah. it, it really is a cult, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, she was excellent on that subject. And um, it has all the earmarks of all the cults that we experienced in the 60s, yeah. you know, the Manson cult and things like that. Yes, where you, they call themselves the family. They were more loyal to Charlie Manson than they were their parents. Mm -hmm. Al although, as you point out, you're dealing with extremely vulnerable people yeah. that, that aren't old enough to be able to determine these things. Yeah. Uh, I was watching the news the other night. I was appalled that they have drag queens reading children's drag queen fairy tales oh, yeah. and acting them out at the age of six. Uh. I mean, uh, the sexual power hasn't even developed at the age of six. Yeah. Uh, it, it all comes to be when puberty, and they haven't reached puberty yet. I mean, how can they be dealing with these issues that aren't real issues for them? Well, that's, uh, and that's, you're absolutely right, and that's why it's important to have programming like this that we are featuring this week. And by the way, that, uh, the, the entire five DVD series, uh, five programs, is available from our own religious catalog. You can get that, and, and it's also on demand uh, from our website as well. Let's go to Kim right now. Kim is in North Carolina listening on the EWTN app. Kim, what's on your mind today? Hi. Uh, I'm really glad you all are doing this show, and I really appreciate the knowledge uh, I've heard today. I'm just, you know, I'm a, I thought I knew what was going on, but <laughs> I've noticed the fault. So my question is, Three questions. One is my daughter goes to a private Catholic college. Okay. Um, she was homeschooled, although I had been taking classes here and there in high school and uh, co-ops, that type thing. What Are you seeing any of this on campuses, like even in a private setting? Or like, I know the professors are not like, they're not, uh, you know, attaching to this at all. But this whole transgender uh, water or wallpaper—I mean, you know how kids can have their their sea of water, and then no right. one ever knows where it is. Sure. Or, uh, you right. know, is any of this showing? Because well, that know. issue that issue came up today in the program, and the person who ran it said you need to be proactive and protective about your children because you don't know, but it's very possible. She says uh, people will say, well, that's not in my school yet, and she says you don't know. Yeah. A, and B, the author said, um, even in some Catholic schools, this can be uh, found because, you know, some Catholic schools, they don't vet people based on Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And even if they do... 
uh, I know of one Catholic college in particular where the theology department is quite orthodox. I mean, there are priests that run it, mm -hmm. but they had a president in the 90s who uh, d decided that non-theology and philosophy subjects could be taught by anybody. So he brought in all these non-Catholics who had a totally different cultural agenda, mm. and now they're the majority and run the academic senate. Ay, ay, ay. So that means they can determine policies at the school, even though the theology department might be totally against. So you need to be proactive about what's going on. Yeah, uh, Kim, thanks for your call. Be sure to do that research when you're when you're looking at colleges. There are colleges that have the word Catholic somewhere in in their name, and yet are they actually teaching what the Catholic Church teaches? Not in every case, as you say, Father. No, it's Catholic with a small C, not a big one. I'm afraid so. <laughs> um, well, yeah, in, in, in many cases, and, and, and I know that there are organizations out there that will help you along with this that will say, you know, this college, you know, follows the mandatum the Cardinal, of the church. The Cardinal Newman Society. Exactly, uh, exactly. The Cardinal uh, Newman Society, they publish their list every year of, right. uh, you know, and, you know and, and that is a great tool. It's a tool that, that my wife and I used when we were looking at colleges for our son. So it's very, very important. Right. So you're listening to a special program this week, The Transgender Movement, What Catholics Need to Know, here on EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. And uh, I know that uh, I, I'm certainly looking forward because I think it's very easy if you listen to the first few shows in this series, it's very easy for somebody to fall into in, into despair. And that's certainly not where we're going no. with all this. We have we have tools at our disposal as parents, as concerned citizens, as Catholics to to try to, you know, guide those kids, because as as you say, Father, these are. These are like the holy innocents. They don't know what they don't know. Also in colleges, now of course they're pretty old and they're almost totally a majority where they can make their own choices, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. But I remember in, in the 70s already, I took an interview once to be a dorm priest. I'm glad it didn't happen <laughs> at a Catholic college. And I used the word that we were, that we were sitting in the place of the parents and almost everybody, even the people who were pushing me, said, oh, you didn't use in local parentis, did you? Because they don't believe in that anymore. Mm. Uh, you know, the people who are vetting people to work in the dormitories and stuff, as far as they're concerned, you just turn a blind eye if they're having sex in the rooms or whatever. You're not sitting in place of the parents. Well, that's not what Catholic doctrine is. Catholic doctrine is until a person reaches majority where they can make their own moral choices, which is normally between 18 and 21, um, that the parents still run the show. Now, you, you may do that in a very benign way, but still you have to guide your, your children and you have responsibility for them. Mm. So... Let me ask. Well, but, but before I ask my question, let's let's go back to the phones because uh, we do have some um, some lines standing by. Audrey is in Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Audrey, what's on your mind today? Um, my daughter's pretty swept up in this. She went. She's a, currently a junior. She went from wearing dresses and looking very feminine in her freshman year to looking like an unkempt fifteen-year-old boy. And um, she is in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And what I want to know is where can I find good, legitimate help for her? Cause even talking to her, she's struggled with a lot of mental health issues, um, one of them being uh, eating disorder. You know, her current person that I talked to about this is like, well, you know, it's just a style. Didn't you dress differently when you were young? I'm like, um, not like this. Our, our phone screener, Matt, says that she is, she is claiming to be a pansexual. Is that right, Audrey? Yes. Wow. <laughs> what is that, Father? Or does that even exist? I have no idea. Okay. All right. But you're all sexes, or I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You know, it's not funny, obviously. But the thing is that, um, uh, as, as they, they were saying, social media causes a lot of this. And when they get kids off social media... They who've experienced depression and all these things, 
Uh-huh. It's a totally different child. Also, um, one of the points they made was, you know, some people experiment with the other sex when they're still not fully integrated, uh-huh. acting somewhat like they're dressing somewhat like they are acting that way. But they, they're not too worried if the person's always exhibited this characteristic. But if it's a sudden change, they say that's an infallible sign that the cult is taking over. Wow. So um, you need to to think about that. Um, I don't know. You know, uh, I can only go by my own childhood and what I've observed. Uh it's around middle, the middle of around 16 when people finally begin to accept and integrate into their sex fully uh, because, the, you know, with all this hormone stuff going on, oh, my goodness, it's a wonder anybody, any of them knows what's, what's happening. Occasionally people use to t- t- quote their teenagers to them, I hate you, and things like that. I said, look, don't, I taught Catholic high school. I can't speak for girls because I understand they're very different than men. <laughs> but I said for men, just be patient. Um, you know, things, they, they don't exactly know who they are, and they're trying all kinds of different things to try to figure it out. And the last person on earth they're going to look to for guidance is you. But uh, you still need to give it in a loving way. And I remember when I finished teaching high school, I went to teach at a university, and several of the students I'd had in high school went to that school. They were freshmen. So the first day they came up to me on the campus and they said, oh, Father Brian, Father Brian, we're so glad to see you. And I looked at them and I said, wait a minute. I've heard it rumored. It is true. You do become human beings after high school. <laughs> and they go, oh, no, 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 no. That's funny. And, and, and you know, my, my teenager told me he hates me. I said, listen, remember, they're teenagers. You're the adult in the room. Yeah. They don't know what they're saying for the most part. It's true. It's a shock you to, it, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. They're crazy. You're listening to teenagers, like that woman Greta. They brought her to the United Nations and yeah. let a teenager tell them what to do. What kind I, of planet do these people live on? I anyway? know, I know. Any any thoughts there, Father, on where we can find uh, help for this young lady? Well, I think this book is excellent. Okay. I, I would recommend it to you, the one that was on the network. Today. Okay. Again, the name of that book that was talked about today, Desist, Detrans, and Detox, Getting Your Child Out of the Gender Cult. And uh, for our caller, Audrey, Uh, The author's name is Maria Keffler, K-E-F-F-L-E-R. So you may want to check into that, Audrey. Uh, I want to thank the people that uh, called in. Uh, We just didn't have time to get them on the air, Jerry and Kathleen and the others. Father, could you leave us with your blessing, please? May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for joining us. A very important program. I know it was a it, it was a tough one, but a, a, a very necessary one. So thank you so oh, much. Oh yeah. Uh, t- again, tomorrow, Catholic pastoral care for transgender issues with Father Philip Philip Bochansky. He is the executive director of Courage International. After the program, we'll be back with EWTN's vice president for theology, Mr. Colin Donovan. On behalf of our great team here, I'm Tom Price, along with Father Brian Malady. Thanks for joining us on this very special program, the part four of the transgender movement, What Catholics Need to Know. We'll see you again tomorrow. God bless. If it's central to the faith, you can find it on EWTN Podcast Central, featuring the best of EWTN Radio, as well as faith-filled podcasts from our friends and affiliates across the nation, all in one place, all free. The destination for great Catholic audio programming is EWTN Podcast Central. It's like podcast heaven.